on episode 430 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Ken Berry and discuss his book, Lies My Doctor Told Me. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 430. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness. The 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Hello, and thank you for being a part of 40 Plus Fitness Podcast. I'm really glad you're here today. Uh, We have a really good guest. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. But before we get into that, I did want to remind you that there's still time for you to get the legacy rate on the 40 plus fitness online personal training, our group training. With the group training, you get weekly conference calls. You get direct access to me through the 40 plus fitness online training app that you have on your phone or you can have on your computer. Uh, and, And the cool thing is that the weekly conference calls, the nutrition advice, the coaching on health, uh, on fitness, all of that's there along with the mindset stuff. I'm there with you each and every step of the way. So now you can focus on your health and fitness and there's no better time to do that than right now. So go to 40 plus fitness podcast.com forward slash health and join 40 plus fitness today. Our guest today is a family physician, speaker, and author based near Nashville, Tennessee. He's really, really prominent in the keto space. That's where I've I've heard him and met him. Uh, He's really good about that. He does a lot of stuff on YouTube. He does a lot of stuff on Instagram. He's really kind of out there into the social media of things, really trying to get the message out there about how changes in our lifestyle will and and do impact our health. And in many cases, our doctors might not have that right. So with no further ado, Here's Dr. Barry. Dr. Barry, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Hey, Alan. Thanks so much for having me. You know, uh, I've, I've read your book, uh, Lies My Doctor Told Me. I've, I've heard you speak a few times about it as well. Uh, I'm a follow, your, a follow you on social media. So I'm, I'm really familiar with, with your messaging and your approach, which I, I think is really comfortable. You're, you're a down-home kind of guy. Uh, this book was written in that same kind of style that I would expect from you. This is a you know, here's some things to think about. Here's some things to do. And uh, I really like uh, the approach you took with this book. Thank you. Now, the title, <laughs> Lies My Doctor Told Me, uh, it's, a, it's a compelling title. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's out there. It's like, okay, well, why, why would my doctor lie to me? Or, you know, is my doctor really lying to me? Uh, what's going on there? You know, why, why might our doctors have it wrong? Well, if you go to get a haircut, and your barber tells you, you know, you should eat more whole grains, Alan, then your barber has no fiduciary duty to your health, to your nutrition. He just has to cut your hair well, right? And so that would just be a myth or a misconception or a misstatement. But when someone has taken an oath to to do no harm and who has taken it upon themselves to drape the stethoscope over their shoulder, I believe they should be held to a higher standard. I believe that they should go over and above and go out of their way to actually know about the care and feeding of the human animal. And that's why I chose to use the word lie instead of myth, because it's actually, it's legally a lie if your doctor gives you bad medical advice. That's legally looked upon in the eyes of the law as a criminal act. And that's why I chose to use that word, even though the the first publisher I thought about going with uh, did not like that and wanted me to change that. And that's why I initially self-published the book. And then Victor Bell Publishing later was happy to put out a second edition. But that's why I use that word. And I understand the strong language, but I think at this stage of the game, at this stage of metabolic disease, where it's actually more common in the United States to have uh, at least some of the precursors of metabolic syndrome than tonight. It's actually more common to be overweight or obese or morbidly obese than it is to have a normal body mass index. I think the time for kid gloves and, and syrupy sweet messages are over. I think it's time to be real and be honest and call things what they are. Yeah, you know, I, I was an auditor in a previous life. And when I first came through, they didn't want to use the word fraud because they felt it was too 
you know, out there. So we use the term irregularities. Um, right. And after, after things got bad with the world calm and all that kind of stuff, there was this fundamental switch where we said, no, we, we actually have to start using the word fraud because people are not paying attention. Uh, they exactly. think an irregularity is where someone just made a mistake. And we're like, no, an irregularity is where someone actually did something wrong. Uh, so purpose. let's start yeah, on purpose. So let's call it fraud. Now, my doctor, when I go to him and he tells me, you know, I need to get rid of the egg yolk uh, because that's got cholesterol and it's bad for me. He still believes that in his heart of hearts that I yes. don't need the dietary cholesterol. So in a, in a sense, as I'm talking to him, it is, it is a lie. Uh, it's a lie of omission or a lie of just him not getting the education. Now, doctors, they're responsible to go get CPE or I don't know what you guys call it, uh, continuing education units. Uh, as a, a public accountant, I had to do that. I had to do at least 40 hours a week, a, a year. Uh, as a personal trainer, I have to go for about four days of training each year. Now I get to pick what training I do. Um, why, why are doctors not looking at this crisis of obesity and saying, you know, I, I might want to go to a few things that are going to help me answer these questions of why my patients are getting sicker? Probably the main reason that your doctor thinks that he's doing an okay job is because we're taught in medical school and residency as physicians that all patients are non-compliant. And so when he tells you, you know, you need to avoid the egg yolks and eat lots of whole grains and lots of fruits and vegetables, uh, he doesn't think you're actually doing that. He thinks you're laying on the couch eating honey buns and Doritos that's that's just the, the physician mindset. We don't think that patients actually follow our advice, although we're duty bound to give advice. And so I really think physicians, they should start falling into two camps. And I think both both camps are perfectly moral and ethical. And so the camp one would be a doctor who's just not interested in nutrition, who doesn't care one iota about it. That doctor should just tell patients, look, I don't know anything about human nutrition. All I know how to do is prescribe you medicine and order tests and order, you know, diagnostic imaging uh, exams. I don't know anything about what you should and shouldn't eat. I mean, look at me. I'm 20 pounds overweight. I, you know, I'm pre, pre-diabetic. I, obviously, I don't know. So if a doctor prefaced any conversation about health and nutrition with that, that'd be perfectly moral and honest because, Patients look up to their doctor and they expect that their doctor knows. And I think that's a reasonable expectation that your doctor should know about the proper care and feeding of, of human beings. And so if you're a doctor and, and you're listening to this and you're like, I just don't care about nutrition. I don't care if keto's right or vegan. I don't care. Then tell your patient that. Disclose that at the beginning of the interview so that if you do give nutrition advice in the future, they'll know, oh, he, this guy doesn't even care about that. He's not going to, this is probably wrong. But if you don't put out a disclaimer like that as a doctor, then your patient, there's a, there's a bit of blind belief. Because when it all comes down to it, the patient either has to believe you or not. And if their health is at risk, they're, they're going to believe a trusted health expert, which is what a doctor's considered to be. And so the second School of doctors should be doctors who are actively reading and researching and looking and studying about human nutrition, because obviously the reason that we're all overweight and, and metabolically ill is not because we're laying around. I mean, there's actually research that shows that we're just as active now as we were in the 1800s. And back in the 1800s, there was no obesity. I mean, you'd have to search all over a town to find the one guy who's overweight back then. So you can't say it's lack of activity. Some people want to blame it on food additives. Some people want to blame it on jet fuel in the water. You know, there's all these, these scapegoats. But in the end, it's the food we're eating. That's what it is. And a doctor either needs to be knowledgeable about that or shut up about that. Yeah, it was interesting. My, my doctor, um, I really liked him, but uh, he, he had a nutritionist on staff. So he would just say, you know, okay, we're going to, we're going to look at your blood work and just, and it, but here's a nutritionist to talk to you about the nutrition side of this. Yeah. And I'll that's, be over that's, here. More, that's much more ethical and, and much more consistent to just admit, I don't know a damn thing about nutrition. I'm going to send you to a nutritionist. Hopefully they do. Cause that should be the message because often they do not. Well, he still put a little bit of tidbits in there, like, you know, the egg yolk thing. And, and so he had his own kind of 
methodology, his own approach, his own thought process that was actually in conflict with what his nutritionist was saying. But at the same time, I had the information presented to me and I felt like that was a, a pretty good deal. So if we don't feel we're comfortable getting that information, um, we need to, we need to stick it out ourselves or find a better doctor. Yes. You know, over the years, you know, things will come up and then they'll rise back up. They'll go back down. And so kind of the two, and I'm going to call them warring sides because it almost, it is, it's tribal is you have one camp and then I'm calling both of these elim- elimination diets. That's kind of how I look at them. One is the vegan and the other side is the carnivore. Yes. And both of them, you know, they'll put science out there and say, this is why our diet's right. Can you kind of just walk us through? I know you're a little bit more over to the carnivore side uh, of this conversation. So I, that's why I wanted to have you on here. Cause I, I just had a vegan on uh, a few weeks ago. And so I wanted to kind of bring this in and say, okay, let's, let's talk about what this science is really telling us. Yes. And so I think that a real whole food vegan diet is better than the standard American diet. And so, but now if if the vegan or vegetarian diet you're talking about is including lots of processed whole grains and lots of industrial vegetable seed oils and lots of sugar, whether added sugar or natural sugar, then it can be almost as bad as the standard American diet. Uh, I think that since the beginning of humanity as a species, we have eaten as much fatty meat as we can get our hands on. This is, uh, this is documented in the paleoanthropological record without doubt. We're able to go back and look at bones, whether they're 10 years old or, or, or 100,000 years old, and look at the bones and the teeth, and we can actually do something called stable isotope analysis. And we can look at the carbon, the nitrogen, and the strontium and other uh, elemental analysis, and we can tell without doubt what these people ate that that's not up for debate. And so if any vegan says that we've always eaten a plant-based diet and we we've eaten animals, if we were starving or had to, that's exactly backwards. And the the anthropological record is very, very clear on that. That's really not up for debate at all. If you ask any, any paleoanthropologist, they'll tell you, we ate as much fatty meat as we could get our hands on. And we ate veg when we wanted to, or when we had to. And so Is a vegan diet less inflammatory than the standard American diet? Yes, absolutely. Can can someone switch from the standard American diet to a vegan diet and improve their health markers or lessen inflammation? Absolutely. No doubt about it. But the problem with the vegan diet is they always compare their results to results of somebody eating the standard American diet. And so that would kind of be like somebody, you know, comparing crack addicts to marijuana addicts. Yeah, marijuana's a little less bad, but that doesn't make it good, at least for most people. Does that make sense? Yeah, so absolutely. I, I think the problem is with their paradigm. I think vegans are very earnest and honest, and I think they fully believe what they're saying. And I do think there are benefits of removing all the, the added sugars and the soft drinks and all the, the grains and all of the, the highly processed, highly inflammatory industrial seed oils from your diet. Huge benefits from that. And so vegan may be where you land up, but I don't think you're going to find optimal health there. I think you're going to find health improvement, but unless you continue to move along the nutrition spectrum until you add enough fatty meat to your diet, enough liver, enough bone marrow, enough things like that to get all of the vital nutrition that a human body needs and a human mind, you're just not going to have optimal health. And indeed, we've seen in the last few years, many high level vegans come out and say, you know, I had to add some salmon back to my diet or I had to add eggs back to my diet because although some things were doing well, I just my mentally I wasn't doing well or energy wise, I wasn't doing well. And you've you've seen that multiple, multiple times, but I I haven't seen many high level uh, fatty meat, heavy keto influencers or carnivore influencers said, you know, I had to add some kale back into my diet. I just wasn't feeling good. You just don't see that. Yeah. You know, every time I see a study, um, you know, they'll be, they, they love throwing out the cancer word. Uh, vegans really love that when they're talking because they're like, red meat's going to give you cancer. Um, but every time I've seen a study that even goes close to that, it, it says, you know, red meat and processed meat, uh, they, they have to pair those together. They don't ever 
kind of segregate those out to see that one might be a confound or the other. Uh, and then they'll go into the, well, when you cook your meat on a grill, you're, you're doing this thing to it. So there's this, this battle there of, do we include red meat in our diet or is it, is it bad for us? Yeah. And I actually have a, st- a chapter in the book about red meat and about processed meat. All of the nutrition data that's been collected, all the nutritional research that's been done is based on food frequency questionnaires, which I'm sure you and and many of your followers are familiar with. And so you would go and ask a person, how many cups of ribs have you eaten in the last six weeks? How many many pounds of brisket have you eaten? And so the average person who surveyed in these studies is not a carnivore, right, Alan? So they're not just, so when they eat hamburger, they're not just eating hamburger. When they eat a hot dog, they're not just eating hot dogs and nothing else. They're also eating the ketchup and the, the bun that's from just highly processed wheat. They're eating the French fries, which is pure starch fried in the inflammatory industrial seed oils. They're eating all of the accompaniments of that hamburger because there's not many people like me who would just go to Wendy's and order six hamburger patties and put some mustard on them and that'd be their meal. Most people in these surveys are not doing that. And so you cannot tease out okay, yeah, this person ate more meat, but what that really meant was that person was going to Wendy's or McDonald's more and getting, and getting the, the Super Whopper Jumbo Super Size meal and drinking a 40-ounce Coke or Diet Coke with that little piece of meat that they were eating. That doesn't prove anything about meat. Does that make sense? I mean, that, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Question, that question is totally cloudy. I and mean, there's no way to tease that out. The only way to ever do this is to just take 50 people and put them on just a pure carnivore diet and 50 people and put them on a pure vegan diet, and then 50 more and put, let them eat just whatever the hell. And then follow those people for 10 years or 15 years. That's the only way this question's ever going to be settled. And I doubt seriously anybody really wants to do that study. The carnivores don't have, we don't have the millions of dollars needed to put on that kind of study. The vegans, I guarantee you don't want to put on that study because they're afraid of what the results will show. And that's why you don't see that type of study done by Harvard School of Public Health or any of the other huge plant-based nutrition authorities. They're never going to do that study. Which, which then puts us in this, in this paradigm of, okay, there are people who have been carnivore for a number of years. Uh, there are people who have been vegan for a number of years. And if we start paying attention to their health, health outcomes, that should give us yes. at least some data. And then we can do the experiment ourselves. If we feel exactly comfortable right. that we're not doing something to harm ourselves, you know, we don't want to run out there and start a, an eat, a way of eating when we start watching other people, you know, <laughs> tailing exactly. off. Yeah. And one of the things you brought up earlier, which I think is really, really important, is uh, fueling our brain or actually building our brain. Um, th- the brain is not made out of plant matter. Right. Not at all. It's made out of pure fat, cholesterol, <coughs> and some collagen to hold it all together. I mean, the brain is a, is a fatty organ. And the brain uses 20 to 25% of your total energy each day, even though it's very small in comparison to other huge organs like your your liver and your muscles and your skin. But so much of mental disease comes from diet. So much of of suffering, so much of fatigue, so much of mental fog, uh, forgetfulness, early onset symptoms of dementia, all of this stuff is coming from the diet. And uh, one of the Blue Cross Blue Shield organizations just published a kind of an alert saying, hey guys, to doctors, the incidence of dementia in 30 and 40 year year olds is up 300% over the last few years. Could you guys maybe look into that and see what's going on? Because, you know, Blue Cross is a huge health insurer and they're looking at this like, there's no way we're going to be able, I mean, if if this becomes, if it becomes common for people in their 40s and 50s to be disabled with dementia, we're not going to, we'll go, everybody's going to go broke. And so you might want to look into this. So what it what went from being a very rare thing a hundred years ago, you know, great grandmother might have a little bit of forgetfulness, but there were not 30 something and 40 something year old people running around with Alzheimer's dementia a hundred years ago. That just did not happen. So even if you went back and, and ate what I just called the hundred year diet, just literally went back and found a couple of cookbooks from 1920 and ate only what was in those, you would do better 
than you would do with the standard American diet. We've really got to wake up or we're going to be faced with not only a personal health crisis, both mental and physical, but a nationwide and a worldwide just health catastrophe where there, there is no amount of money that's going to help keep people well. It's just it's going to all fall apart if we don't start feeding the human animal the proper human diet. That has to happen at some point or the problem will become unsolvable. Yeah, you know, it, it is something that I, I, I just, you, know, you, you put your head around this idea that what you put in your mouth is a building block for what your body is going to be made out of. Yeah. And if you're not getting, you know, we obviously know if we don't give ourselves adequate nutrition, uh, then we start seeing those deficiencies and, and that usually manifests in some form of, of problem for us. But there's this kind of thing going on in the background, particularly like with building our brain, with building our bones, with building our muscles, with building all of us, that if we're not putting the right material in there, uh, we're making ourselves out of fluff. Exactly. If I took you, Alan, and I locked you in my barn, this is a common analogy I use, and I fed you nothing but ribeye steak and beef liver and that's and water and salt, and that literally is all I gave you, fresh meat, fresh liver, and water and salt. You understand, you could live in my barn for decades and you would not develop any, any vitamin or mineral deficiencies. And I'm happy to talk about vitamin C if you want to, because there have been carnivores for 20, 25 years whose skin and teeth look amazing. They don't have scurvy. And so there's more to the vitamin C story than you have to eat lots of fruits. But if I took, uh, took you again in an alternate life and locked you in my barn and fed you nothing but plants, and on either one of these diets, you can't have supplements. You can only eat food. So you could have any plant from anywhere in the world, from the from Australia to Panama to the Himalayan mountains, any berry, any herb, any root you wanted. It wouldn't be many months, if not, maybe a year, you would start to develop serious fatty acid deficiencies and serious amino acid deficiencies. You would start to, to get sick, you would suffer, and you would die early from eating that diet that was restricted of the vitamins and minerals that you can only find in meat in any meaningful quantity. And so, again, that's another research study that will never be done. We're never going to lock 50 people in our barn and feed them carnivore and 50 and feed them vegan because it's very unethical to lock people in your barn, first and foremost. You can't do that. Well, if, if, if you have a, a gym in there and I get Netflix, <laughs> right. I'm probably good to go. <laughs> yeah, if you had a gym and Wi-Fi, I might hang around for a few years. Exactly. Well, you know, one of the things I was interviewing one week, one vegan, and uh, one of the concepts he came up with is because I, you know, on the one side, you're like, well, you're not getting B12, you supplement with it. And, he's, and his, his response was, well, carnivores have to supplement with statins. No. Okay. Yeah, there is no such thing as a statin deficiency. Statin medications are one of the most dangerous medications that a doctor can prescribe. And I'm not saying there's never an instance where a statin might have more benefit than harm, but 99% of the time, a statin drug, and this is Lipitor, Zocor, Crestor, there's a couple of new ones, 99% of the time, they do more harm than good. Uh, if you take your statin faithfully for 20 years, you might add three days to your life. In the process of that, you've lowered your testosterone, you've raised your blood sugar, you've raised your levels of inflammation, you've increased your, your muscle fatigue, your muscle aches and pains. Your life has gotten worse. Just the, the just kind of your well-being uh, measurement has gotten worse. You've lowered your testosterone, which is uniformly bad. You've raised your blood sugar, which is uniformly bad. And the, really the only way that the statins work is with an anti-inflammatory effect that they also appear to have, which is well known in the literature. It has nothing to do with lower, lowering total cholesterol. That's not how they give you those three extra days of life that you've got for paying 20 years worth of copays. Yeah. I, um, my cholesterol naturally runs kind of on the high end. And so that, you know, when, when those scares come out, you know, my doctor sees my cholesterol, it, you see, so always kind of trying to push me in that direction. And I just, I just always kind of pull back and say, you know, I've, I've tried them. I don't like how I feel on them. Uh, they mess with my muscles. He says, well, we'll just try a different one. I'm like, no, I'm not going yeah. there anymore. Uh, I've seen enough. Um, I don't believe that's going to be, I don't believe my cholesterol number is, is really a big deal. 
because my high cholesterol relative to my total cholesterol is, is actually really, really good. My high cholesterol relative to my triglycerides, really, really good. So those ratios to me are, are what I want to see versus just this big number. Now, doctors in their standard of care are, are probably still going to have that conversation with you. And you have to talk to your doctor and realize, you know, there are some things that you could probably do to lower it, but it's a building block for testosterone. It, um, statins uh, also, don't they affect the COQ10, which damages oh, the heart? Yeah. So yeah. if you're going to be on a statin, you're probably going to want to supplement with COQ10 just to 100%. make sure. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's, that, like you said, there's not a, a, an absolute for any one of us to say that we wouldn't benefit from it, but it's just something that uh, you're putting a foreign substance in your body and it's, it's causing some other side effects and you, you have to weigh that and let that pay. And just the, the vegan argument of, well, those people are going to develop a statin deficiency. A statin is a patented molecule that's made in a factory. And so you can understand their mindset a little bit. They're like, either you're going to have to take supplements made in a factory or you're going to have to take a statin made in a factory. Uh, what about 100,000 years ago? I mean, how did we get by? How did, how did we prosper and flourish? I mean, we became the alpha species on this planet. A long time before people uh, started advocating just eating plants or started advocating patented fake molecules like Lipitor, Zocor, or Crestor. I, I agree. Uh, another thing that we do now that we, we didn't do then uh, is we, we avoid the sun. Uh, we slather on sunscreen because we, we don't want to get the, the skin cancer. Um, but we need sunshine. <laughs> Absolutely. Can you go Absolutely. into that a little bit? Actually, I, yeah, I have a chapter in the book about that. Sunlight and getting a, a, a healthy tan is in no way a risk factor for skin cancer. Absolutely not. The research done on this is just laughable. It's embarrassing that, that when, I mean, dermatologists are some of the smartest doctors out there. In med school, you had to have almost a, a perfect 4.0 to even be considered for a dermatology residency. So these people started out very, that they were the cream of the cream in medical school. And now just to say something as dumb as stay out of the sun or you'll get skin cancer. It's just, it's ludicrous. Uh, the, a lot of the research done on that was done on donated foreskins. So when a, a little baby boy is circumcised, they would do little research studies on that looking for, markers that they decided were markers of a precancerous condition. The little foreskins didn't develop skin cancer. That's not what happened. They just uh, had this marker or that marker go up a little bit when exposed to UV radiation. And so they decided that meant that it's going to cause skin cancer. I mean, all and, and, and there's just so many things I talk about in the book that just make this a ridiculous lie that doctors tell patients. The sun protectors, the blockers, the SPF, what is it up to? 250 now, SPF 250 or something. I don't know. These things are full of, some of them are full of very worrisome chemicals that if you put slather these on your small child, you can actually detect these chemicals in your child's bloodstream minutes later. There's a study published just recently about that. You, uh, you're going to slash your child's ability to make vitamin D if you slather this sunscreen on them. Uh, maybe expose them to chemicals that are not good for them. And I, I definitely don't want you or your child to get a sunburn. Absolutely not. Because first of all, it hurts. And pain is a feedback that we have developed to show, yeah, that's dumb. Don't do that anymore. But getting a healthy tan, getting your vitamin D from the sun, and who, who knows what else we get from the sun, Alan? Because basically back in the late 60s and early 70s, when it, it became the trope, oh, skin, sun exposure causes skin cancer, just imagine if you'd have been a young researcher at Harvard and you'd went to your, your chairman and said, hey, I want to do a study. I think that we probably use the sun for other things besides just making vitamin D. I'd love to expose some people to UV radiation and see what that does to other levels in their body. Do you understand you would have been kicked out of the chairman's office and probably released from your duties? Yeah. It was just, it's unstudiable at this point in the, in the higher institutions of learning because it's considered settled science that the sun causes cancer, but nothing can be further from the truth. And so many of the carnivores play in the sun in their loincloth every day and their skin looks amazing. They don't have skin cancer. Actually people who work at the equator, and this is not dark skin people. This is even light skin people. They have less melanoma, which is the worst skin cancer 
than people who are fully clothed and live in Norway. So you can't say, you just can't say that sun exposure causes cancer. It's a dumb thing to say. And I, in the, in the chapter in the book, I actually give people the email address for the two largest dermatological societies. And I said, email them and ask them, show, send me the research study that shows that sun exposure increases my risk of cancer. And so many people have, have messaged me and said, you know, I didn't get anything or I got the foreskin study, which doesn't prove anything. And so literally that's what it's based on. Yeah, I had Dr. Dallas Harwig on uh, not long ago. And one of the things that he kind of gets into is that, uh, you know, we, we talk about light exposure at night being a problem for our sleep. Uh, but he proposes that getting out into the sun, getting out into open air, blue, blue skies uh, on a regular basis during the day is actually very important for us to maintain a good, solid circadian rhythm. Absolutely. You know, and so they're, they're, that in and of itself is just saying you need to be outside getting some of that light exposure to set everything in place for you to get a good night's sleep, for you to build your yep. you know, hormones and, and all the good stuff that happens to us when we go through really good sleep cycles. Uh, so that's even another thing is it, it get outside and do some things. Now, uh, what I've found is, is, yeah, if you go out there the first day and you're, you stay out for six hours in the sun, you're going to get a sunburn. But if you get some exposure and pull back, get some exposure and pull back, you, you're, you're, you tan and you get used to that exposure and it's like, like a muscle. You, you just build a capacity to be out in the sun longer and longer uh, and not burn. And I'll tell you something very interesting, Alan, that I've noticed in my own personal health journey and that hundreds of other people have said, you know, that same thing happened to me. I thought I was crazy, but maybe not. Back when I was just eating the, just the standard American inflammatory diet, I couldn't stay out in the direct sun on a beach at, at the latitude of, you know, uh, Florida, Tampa Bay, Panama City. If I stayed out for 10 minutes, one minute longer, I was going to get a sunburn. And I almost could not build up. I couldn't build the extra melanin and build up the tolerance to the sun. And I was the guy who would tell my phone, hey, wake me up in 10 minutes. And then I would go play with the kids for 10 minutes. And then I had to go get under the umbrella or the rest of the vacation would be ruined because I'd be crybabying about my sunburn. As I converted to paleo and then to, to, to real whole food keto, I'm not a big keto product fan. I want you to eat real whole one ingredient foods. I noticed that I could stay in the sun longer without burning. I noticed that I tan better. And I'm like, maybe it's all of the bright green colors, all the beta carotene or something in the vegetables. but back what's it been 15 months now when I when I did that first carnivore month challenge on my Facebook group and said hey guys let's eat nothing but fatty meat for a month and see what happens when I started the carnivore diet I can stay out in the sun five times longer now without burning I can develop a radiant tan and I just I thought I was permanently fish belly color I didn't think I could tan back in the day now I can develop a good, healthy tan. It's much harder for me to burn in the sun now than it was 10 years ago. And when I started, when I said that on a podcast, I had multiple people reach out to me who were either fatty, fatty meat, heavy keto or carnivore and say, yes, 100%, that happened to me too. And so now my current theory is, is that basically every cell in your skin has a cell membrane, right? And if you're eating enough fatty meat, to build that cell membrane out of good cholesterol and good fatty acids, then that cell is actually able to function better than a cell that's built out of canola oil and all the other inflammatory crap that we eat. And, and I, I've noticed that personally and have had hundreds of other people verify, yep, I had the same thing happen to me. And indeed, if you look at most carnivores, they're, they're always very tan. And it looks like that their sun is just much more able to use the powerful tool of sunlight to actually optimize their health instead of burning them. There's, there's one other thing I wanted to talk to you about before you have to go And I, I was, I was sitting there with this guy and he, we were talking and um, you know, of course it comes up that who I am and what I do, I own a gym and I do the fitness stuff. And so uh, that's going to be where the conversation 99% of the time is going to go when I'm sitting down with someone. And he said, you know, he said, I, I was exercising and I lost all that weight and then I stopped exercising and I've gained it all back. And he says, I need to get back to exercising. So I'll lose that weight. 
And, you know, I put up my hand and I said, it's what you're putting in your mouth. It's not the yes. exercise. And you talk about this in the book. Can you go into a little bit more detail there? Yeah, exercise. I think exercise is like sunlight, Alan. I think it does hundreds of beneficial things for the human body and the human mind. It's a powerful, powerful tool that we should all use regularly. But if you are overweight, obese, or morbidly obese, exercise is a terrible method for losing fat. And that's been borne out in multiple huge studies. The Women's Health Initiative study, uh, they calorie restricted for a long period of time. And so calorie restriction can either be from burning more or from eating less. Either way, that's, you're supposed to wind up with a calorie deficit. That's how weight loss is supposed to, uh, is supposed to happen. And indeed, if I lock you in that bar of mine, Alan, and I, and I starve you, you're definitely going to lose weight. But it's not going to be just fat. You're going to also lose muscle mass. You're going to lose cartilage density. You're going to lose fascial density. You're going to lose bone density. But nobody wants that. When, when we all say, when every one of us say, I want to lose some weight, what we actually meant to say was, I want to lose some of this stored energy, some of this fat. That's what I want to lose. To do that, you have to change your diet. And I applaud you for being a gym owner and saying, hey, Bubba, exercise ain't going to help you lose weight fat. You got to fix your diet to lose the fat. Now, if you want to increase your endurance and you want to increase your, your muscle, then yeah, get in the gym. But if you're just trying to lose fat, step one is always, 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 without exception, fix your diet. That's how you lose the fat and how you lose most of the inflammation. Yeah. And, and I'll tell them then the next step is whole food, you know, just, just yes. whole food. If I, I don't know many people who eat a whole food diet that really have a weight problem. Exactly right. And that's, and you see this often in the vegans. It's now not in the vegetarians who are eating lots of whole grains and lots of processed crap, but in a true whole food vegan, they're just not obese. Now they may still be pre-diabetic or type two diabetic. They may, may still be quite inflamed, but they're skinny. And that's because you just can't eat enough whole foods to get fat. It's just, it's very, very difficult to do that. You have to eat to discomfort in order to do that, but eating processed foods. Oh, it's very easy to eat and put on too much fat. Absolutely. I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? You got to fix your diet first and foremost. If you're not prepared to, to eat a proper human diet, then just forget all the rest of it and go watch TV. I don't know what to tell you, but when you're ready to actually achieve good health, then you've got to fix your diet number one. But, but that's 90% of the battle is fixing your diet. And whether that is an ovo lacto pescatarian ketogenic diet or whether that is a 100% fatty red meat carnivore diet, I consider all those to be on the spectrum of what I call the proper human diet. That's number one. Number two is you, then you work on your lifestyle. You work on getting that morning sun. You work on getting your bedroom exactly perfect so that you can get the best sleep of your life. You start working out, whether that's going for a walk or whether that's trying to beat your PR on the, on the deadlift, the lifestyle is number two. And then number three, plus or minus maybe a few supplements if you're up in, you know, like I recommend almost everybody over 40 should probably take a little coenzyme Q10 unless they're a carnivore because you're, you're going to get plenty of that, especially if you're a nose to tail carnivore. But most people probably need some coenzyme Q10 after the age of 40. A lot of people who live at the northern latitudes probably need some vitamin D. But that's that's uh, so a lot of people want to start, Alan, with step three. Oh, let me buy a bunch of supplements. Yeah. Waste of time, waste <laughs> of money. A lot of people want to start with step two. Let me join the gym. Let me, because I feel like if I'm paying that monthly fee, that'll make me, no, no, that's, that's, <laughs> you're just, you, that's not ever going to happen. Step one, every single time is fix your damn food. Eat only real, whole, one ingredient foods. If it has more than three ingredients on the package, don't even pick it up. And really, if it has a package, don't pick it up. That's not real food. That's a food-like product that a big food corporation has manufactured to get your five bucks. That's all that is, okay? Uh, and I, I've been saying for a few years now, 
I don't, I think that the food, big food manufacturing is going to crater. There's going to be tons of bankruptcies because there is no real whole food ketogenic product that you can stock on a store shelf that's going to, that you can make in China and ship in a container ship that's going to be shelf stable for two years. Real food don't act like that. And everybody in the keto and carnivore space right now, they're just trying their best to come up with a keto product or a carnivore product. But every single time they do, it has to be processed. It has to have extra crap added to it. And it's either got a very short, short half-life, which means it's still real food, or it's turned into a Franken food like product. That's just, they're after your money. Yeah. I, I would, I would just, uh, put my money into something like Maria Emmerich's uh, keto cookbooks or something like that and go yeah, a lot further. Or start raising sheep, <laughs> start raising chickens, start raising cows. That's the, there'll be some money to make in that, but there won't be billions and billions of yeah. dollars to be made in that. And that's what everybody's looking for is a product that can scale up and make a billion dollars. It's just not going to happen in the keto carnivore space because we eat real food here. We don't want your products. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, so thank you, uh, doctor. If someone wanted to learn more about you, learn more about your book, Lies My Doctor Told Me, uh, where would you like for me to send them? Lies My Doctor Told Me is available as a paperback, as a Kindle, and an Audible, wherever fine books are sold. I have a, a little YouTube channel that I've got, I think, over 270 videos that you can watch for nothing. That's absolutely free to watch them all. If you just go to YouTube and search for Dr. Baring, you should find me, Dr. Barry Keto, Dr. Barry Carnivore, Dr. Barry Thyroid, uh, Testosterone. I talk about all this stuff on the YouTube channel, even toenail fungus. That's one of my biggest videos is how to re reverse and cure toenail fungus and never get it again. And that video has been viewed over 2 million times. So it must be, and there must be some truth in it. Uh, I've got a Facebook page where my wife, Nisha and I, we go live every Monday night. So this is, we're doing this on a Monday. So at 7 p.m. Central, we go live and talk about the latest news articles and the latest silliness in the news and in the media. And then we all answer a bunch of people's questions. I'm um, also on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm even on TikTok, Alan, because I'm trying to go <laughs> grab those young kids before they develop metabolic syndrome. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. Uh, you can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 430, and I'll be sure to have links there. Dr. Barry, thank you so much for being a part of 40 Plus Fitness. That was a pleasure, Alan. I'll, I'll be back anytime you need me. Now, before you get out of here, I just wanted to remind you, you only have until the end of April to get the legacy rate on 40 Plus Fitness online group personal training. This is the time to focus on your health and fitness. Go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash health to learn more today. And if you have some questions about it, feel free to email me. I'm alan at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com. I'll be glad to go over what's going on there. We can schedule a short conference call if that helps you. This is all about mindset. It's all about giving you the tools that you need to be successful on this health and fitness journey and then holding your hand and being there with you as you go through this process. You don't have to go it alone. You can hire a coach. I'm there for you and I'm giving you my best rate ever. Go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash health to learn more today. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, I discuss setting your nutrition cruise control. Until then, have a happy and healthy week. 